Our next presenter before lunch is Mikhail Davis. He's the Director of Restorative Enterprises at Interface, the world's largest manufacturer of modular carpet. He's responsible for advancing Interface's global recognized, globally recognized Mission Zero and Climate Take Back commitments in the Americas by building international leadership capacity and creating external partnerships. He's also currently shares, chairs the lead materials and resources technical advisory group uh, for the US Green Building Council. Please welcome uh, Mikhail in Making Closed Loop Carpet a Reality. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. I, uh, only accepted this speaking engagement because I could walk. Um, but no, it did is wonderful. I'm so glad to see this place full and not just for children's theater, which is usually what I come here for. Um, because if there's anything that you know if you work in this field, it takes collaboration. It really, you know, in the circular economy, the circle works fine until someone drops the ball and then it goes linear pretty quickly. Um, so, this, I'm going to tell you a bit about Interface's journey um, to really, as I said, make, make closed loop carpet a reality. So, to assist me, I brought a couple props. This is what we make. We make squares and rectangles of carpet. Face fiber has carpet in it, post consumer and post industrial. Backing has carpet in it, post consumer and post industrial. Closed loop, it's a reality. It took us a long time to get there. <laughs> so, We started off, uh, actually, I, I will tell a slightly different story. My first job out of college is I got to be uh, David Brower's personal assistant here in Berkeley. Um, and there was a funny thing on his calendar when I took over managing his calendar, which was to go to Georgia, which I had never been to in my life, and meet with a carpet company. Um, and that was Interface. Uh, and this is Ray Anderson back in the heyday of, this, of uh, the 1973 when he founded Interface, when his most radical idea was to make carpet in squares instead of in rolls. That was as radical as he was back then, but it was radical for Georgia and the carpet industry. Um, so moving on, he took the company global. We're now sort of like a, a medium-sized publicly traded company, but we are all over the world. I work for a multinational corporation. The kids at the commune could see me now. <laughs> Uh, so we're about a billion dollars in revenue, about 3,600 employees. Um, but something funny happened along the way to becoming a, a, a multinational billion dollar corporation is that customers in California started asking Ray, what are you doing for the environment? To which he said, the what? <laughs> Uh, because back in, in 1994, Ray was a, just a very successful self-made millionaire who, you know, figured out that, that squares of carpet, you know, were the next big thing in office design instead of rolls. Um, but he also was an innovator and a disruptor by nature who was not afraid to disrupt the carpet industry. And this became the ultimate disruption. Once he got his head around, truly, I would say for Ray, the ethical implications of how he was running his company, that every single product that he had ever made through his whole 40-year career was now in the landfill. Uh, so this was kind of the slogan from the, the Georgia Tech uh, Engineering School, there has to be a better way. And that was what very much what he applied to his commitment to um, reshaping and transforming this very successful, very mainstream, you know, manufacturing company based in Georgia. So that's Ray as, as we all came to know him, those of you, anyone here meet Ray? So this is, this is the Ray we knew, he wasn't this, this slick young CEO here. Um, but yeah, you'd buy something from him, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, Ray devoted the last 17 years of his life, he, he passed in, in 2011, uh, to becoming a sort of CEO environmental evangelist. And his goal, you can see on his napkin drawing here, was that we were going to climb this mountain called Mount Sustainability to show the world that you could have a zero environmental footprint carpet company, a manufacturing company. He said, given how dirty our industry is, if we can do it, maybe anyone can do it. So this was how it got encapsulated, mission zero, eliminating negative impact on the environment by 2020, that's the important thing. It's a North Star aspirational goal with a deadline. <laughs> that changes things. So we're you know, about two years out and uh, we're gonna be doing some really cool things in the next two years to try to hit that and that's the whole point. So this is kind of where we are right now. Um, 
increasing energy efficiency, re reducing carbon footprint, uh, reducing total waste, uh, getting to 87% uh, renewable electricity, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from our direct emissions as well as our supply chain. The last one on, on the bottom here, I want to draw your attention to, this is probably the furthest from our goals we are. We are 58% of our materials. We're, we're making basically 58% of the materials coming into our system are what we'd like them to be, which is either rapidly renewable bio-based or from waste. But 58% of all the materials going into our whole system for products and packaging are from rapidly renewable bio-based. That's about 1% right now. Uh, the other 57% are from waste. Um, so we're a long ways off the 100% we promised for 2020. Uh, that's going to be some of our big plays in the next few years. Um, but no one else is even keeping that metric. Um, I would love it if you had more companies that even kept track of that one. So here's the next big opportunity. You know, we've got uh, about 4 billion pounds of just within our product category of carpet going into the landfill every year. How do we turn that into an opportunity? How do we turn that into an opportunity to make our business better? So I think here in California, we just, uh, we just went through our, our first uh, legislative experience in a while where we, we worked on AB uh, 1158, which we'll talk a bit more about. But that's all about given the gap we have in our goals, we need to scale up our ability to get and use waste materials really quickly which means we've finally admitted we need the government, which people in Georgia don't admit freely. <laughs> so this has been our program. Um, we call it reentry for taking back our own products. Um, this has been many years and many mistakes in the making, uh, but started working on it back in 1996 because we knew part of becoming this company Ray wanted us to be meant that we had to be responsible for all these old products. They couldn't end up in the landfill anymore. Um, so this is, is one of the many expensive machines. So the problem with manufacturing company and, you know, as you know, if you're working and trying to scale recycling in general is all the machines are expensive. And if you miss, if you buy the wrong machine, oh, it really hurts. Uh, we've bought the wrong machine several times. Um, sometimes we're able to find a different piece of the supply chain that will then buy it off us who can make more efficient use of it. Other times we eat that. Um, this was, was actually a machine that has a blade in the middle of it that shears carpet tile. You roll them in there. It was evolved from the leather industry. We were taking fur off of hides. Um, problem with that is it less, still left too much nylon on the surface of, uh, and you ended up with a lot of nylon when you're trying to, for this guy, this is, this is your nightmare for recycling. It's, about, it's a layer cake of about four totally different kinds of plastics. Uh, the most valuable type here, the nylon, is deeply embedded into the other kinds. <laughs> Um, so we've had to evolve a lot of different technology over the years to, to make that economically feasible to recycle our own products. Um, so it's about taking responsibility for our products. It's also about this promise we made to our customers to help them. Okay, you've got carpet, you've got our products or similar on the floor. We need to be able to help you with that. You're our customer. Um, but also more radically, this Ray's vision was to totally decouple his supply chain from oil. He had a vision where, where one day in 2020, you know, someone from the company was going to come deliver him a vial which had the last drop of oil that Interface ever had to use in its products. He didn't quite make it to that, but, uh, but we're, we're carrying on and the uh, current CEO will be happy to accept uh, that vial on his behalf. So this is kind of what it looks like. We had to take all this mixed material, which includes our own scrap, the backing from the products, whatever nylon we can't take out of that mix and figure out how to turn it into a nice uniform pellet. Um, now our engineers have had a great time unlearning everything they learned in machine design class in engineering school, which is that, you know, resource, assume that resources are infinite and completely pure and constant. Exactly the opposite of what the circular economy demands, uh, where you have to assume that the resources are constantly changing and are highly variable um, and definitely not infinite. <laughs> Uh, so th this is, is essentially taking this incredibly mixed stream of plastic and turning it into a uniform density pellet that took inventing about three machines and repurposing a bunch of them from other industries. This is then how you turn it into new backing. This is uh, the pellets come down through here and go over this rolling 
and you have to basically get an even layer of pellets rolling across this conveyor belt moving at the bottom. Um, then you're going to make a little sandwich because there's a, there's a fine layer of fiberglass cloth that goes between the two layers of the backing. You kind of create this sandwich of a pile of pellets with fiberglass and then a pile of pellets and then you run a sort of hot steamroller over the whole thing to turn it into a sheet, which ends up looking something like that. So this, needless to say, took a long time to, to actually make work. On the fiber side, a lot of it has to get done by other people. We still can't get our fiber quite clean enough to go fiber to fiber, but that's absolutely the goal. Um, and we, but we still have a lot of fiber from Broadloom going into the top of our carpet. Um, so this ends with, of course we supported this act because we are trying to scale our supply chain for exactly the materials that a stronger recycling program in California will, will provide to replace our supply chain of oil and plastics with a supply chain of waste plastics. Because this is where we're going, just, just to finish up. If we see in 1994, we kind of have our, our vision where we've got smokestacks. We can take our factories to zero. We're going to go to 100% renewable energy. But eventually, our factories have to be like for us. They have to be giving back. They have to be generous. They have to be generating energy. They have to be sequestering carbon. Similar for the zero waste goal. Zero waste is an interim goal. Next, we need to be eating waste. We need to be sucking up problematic waste. Um, so the final thing I'll talk about is this is a small program. We're using waste fishing nets from now Cameroon and a bunch of villages in the Philippines to make carpet yarn. This carpet yarn will have a small percentage of waste fishing nets that alleviated poverty in the Philippines, kept those plastics out of the ocean, uh, and created community banking in areas that have no financial services. And I'm done. Thank you, Mikael.